Well, we're going to pray and then we're going to look at God's word together. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to open up your word and we pray that you'll quieten our hearts and minds, enable us to hear what you are saying to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to read to you this morning from Paul's letter to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, one verse, verse 12. I'm going to have lots of other verses during the message. Paul says this, he says, I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. A couple of weeks ago, we were looking at the subject of knowing the will of God. And some of you found that message to be helpful. Others still had questions about knowing what God's will was for your lives and how to respond in certain situations. So today I'm going to give you a follow-up message. But first of all, I want to tell you a story. When I was studying for my first degree in business admin, uh, we had to do a trading exercise in a couple of the classes. And our lecturer told us what the general idea of the exercise was. And we uh, formed teams representing different areas of business. There were the manufacturers and the miners, and some were the government. And uh, my team got to be the Reserve Bank. <laughs> I appointed myself governor of the Reserve Bank. And uh, we were to explain uh, to the rest of the, 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 the class you know, what the trading rules were and how the money system worked. And our money was basically different colored disks. And I said, okay, the red disk is the most valuable one, the blue disk is the least valuable one, and there's different values for the other colors that were in between. And so we went through the whole exercise and we were trading with one another. And at the end of the exercise, I called time on the whole thing. And I suggested to everyone, all the different manufacturing groups, it's time for you to count your discs. And one group was overjoyed because they had a stack of blue discs, or red discs rather. And so they thought, well, okay, we are the winners of this trading exercise. As governor of the Reserve Bank, I stood up and devalued all the currencies. <laughs> made the blue discs, the valuable ones, and guess whose desk they were on? Mine. <laughs> Everyone was disgusted. The lecturer was even disgusted with me. Yeah. But there was no rule against what I'd done. It certainly violated the rules of fair play. I guess that was true. But there are a lot of Christians who, who wish that the Bible contained specific rules governing every possible situation in life. Then they think, okay, then we would know what we should do in every situation. They know what they could do, they know what they could not do. A book like that would be really big. I mean, I get enough hassles trying to get you guys to read the Bible as it is, eh? A book like that would be volumes and volumes and volumes and you still wouldn't get to the end of the whole thing. God has, however, given us a book that contains all the principles that we need to be able to live for him in this world. And that is the Bible. Basic instructions before leading, leaving earth. Yeah, you know that? Okay. So today's reading from 1 Corinthians and all the way through till about uh, chapter 10 of Corinthians, Paul lays out some important principles for the Corinthian believers. Now, you see, he was writing here to a bunch of rather immature believers. He says so in, in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 1. He calls them babes in Christ. He reminds them, like little children, they think that there is a rule for everything. Now, have you ever seen little children at play? Of course there are rules for everything, and it doesn't take long before someone's yelling, Not fair! Yeah? Children love rules. Children need rules. They need lots of them. But as our children grow up, as they get ready to leave home, we give them rules to live by, but hopefully we also give our children some principles to live by because we can't discuss every situation with them, can we? So they need to be able to learn how to make their own choices, how they can live their lives. So today I want to talk about some principles for proper practice. And they will give us God's standard by which we can live our lives. And these principles, if they pr are practiced, they will teach you how to live your life, how to respond to situations where you're questioning, what should I do here? And as we, as we grow up in Christ, we need to be liberated from the legalism of rules and learn how to apply principles to our daily living. And that will enable us to make wise decisions 
And making a wise decision, by the way, is a mark of maturity. Let's hope that we are becoming a mature people. Now, these aren't rules. They are principles that every Christian would do well to learn and to use. The first principle is the principle of expediency. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12 says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. Now, this is a compound principle. And there are two questions that are raised here that will help you decide, decide whether something is right or wrong. First of all, is it lawful or right? So there are some things in the Bible where God has made a very clear statement. And if we have a word from the Lord concerning the matter, and it's clear, when God speaks clearly on an issue, then it's settled. Yeah? 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So we go back to the Scriptures and find out, okay, what has God said on this particular subject? There are some very clear moral absolutes in the Bible, like who you can marry or don't marry, who you can have sex with or not have sex with. There are some clear things in the Bible. Sadly, though, that does go against our current culture, which is governed much more each day by moral relativism. And relativism, simply put, is a belief that there's no absolute truth. It all depends on your circumstance or the changing values of our culture. You know, different people can have different views about what is moral and immoral. Just leads to confusion for most of us, doesn't it? So the first thing we need to look at is, is it lawful or is it right? But the second part of that principle is, is it expedient or beneficial? So th something that's expedient, it means that it's going to bring us to a particular destination. So every decision, every activity either moves you towards Jesus or away from Jesus. So ask yourself this question, does what the thing that I'm trying to make a decision on, does it bring me closer to the Lord? If it doesn't, check what you're doing. We all need to have this goal of becoming closer to the Lord, shouldn't we? I know a man by the name of Paul, he was an apostle. And, and he said this in, in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 to 15, he says this. He says, brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if at some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. So Paul says, my goal is to be pressing heavenward. I want to win a prize that God has called me for. I want to be more like Jesus. That's the goal. So does this thing I'm trying to decide on bring me closer to where I need to be or not? Now I can do anything I please and it won't make me unsaved. However, every, not everything I do will help me grow as a Christian. And if it doesn't bring me closer to my destination, it's probably a wrong decision. It doesn't matter what it is. You see, God has a plan for you and he has a plan for me. Ephesians 4.13 says this. Paul is speaking and he says, Until we all reach unity in the faith. So what's the, what's the plan for us? We are to be reaching unity in the faith. Faith of what? And in the knowledge of the Son of God. So unity in the faith, knowing who Jesus is and become mature attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. We are to know who Jesus is and we are to be like him. That's the goal. So, simple. Is it expedient for growing this way? Helps you make a choice, doesn't it? Also, there's the next one, the principle of enslavement. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 12 says, I will not be mastered by anything. The old King James says, I will not be brought under the power of any." To be brought under the power of something else or to be mastered by something means to be enslaved. How many of you are slaves? Well, if I start looking at your lives and asking you about your habits, yeah, I'll bet you there's a few slaves. We were all slaves at one time, slaves to sin. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3 says this, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. 
All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we are by nature deserving of wrath. Wow. The ruler of the kingdom of the air, even the air we breathe, has been fouled in some way. We used to follow him. God willing, we no longer follow the ruler of the kingdom of the air. But we were all slaves at one stage to sin. Paul puts it differently in Romans 6 verse 16. He says, don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. If you are struggling with a sin area in your life and you obey that sin, you're a slave to sin. Well, bad news so far. Time to go home? No, we need some good news, don't we? Yes, all right, good. The good news is we have been delivered by the Lord Jesus. Ephesians 2 verses 4, verses 4 and 5 says this, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Brothers and sisters, you have been saved by the undeserved free gift of God. That's grace. You are able to be free of the sin that's dominating your life. Paul puts it another way. Romans 6 verse 14, he says, For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. Grace is an undeserved free gift. We have the undeserved free gift of the life of Christ right here, inside us. And because of that, we can make right choices. Now, Anything outside of Jesus that controls my life is sin. Paul puts it very powerfully. Romans chapter 4, 23, he says, Everything that does not come from faith is sin. How many things? Everything that does not come from faith is sin. Now, the context of that passage has to do with eating particular kinds of food. But the principle remains the same. Everything that does not come out of our faith relationship with God is sin. We're not depending upon God here. It's a principle that applies to life because there are two forces at work in the world. Jesus puts it another way. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, he says, Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Are you with Jesus or against him? I want to be with him. Yes? All right. So that means we are going to be gathering with him rather than scattering. If you're struggling with a sin area in your life, John 8, 36 says this, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. If you're struggling, come to Jesus. Come to him right now. Put your life in his hand. That situation, the thing that you are struggling with, let him deal with it. And he will set you free. Brothers and sisters, we need to be searching out our lives to be sure that no habit, no attitude, no activity, no pursuit has us enslaved. If you're enslaved... Come to the one who sets the slaves free. Come to Jesus. Bring it to the cross. Bring it to him. He'll set you free on the spot. I've seen it happen so often. Let's go along. The third principle is the principle of example. Listen to what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 8, verses 8 to 13. He says, But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat, and no better if we do. Be careful, however that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you with all your knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause them to fall. Now, this is not saying the way that we should all be vegetarians. Okay? This is saying, though, be careful about what you are doing. You are setting an example. Particularly this situation in Corinth, Paul was writing to the Corinthians. Corinth was a pagan society, and many who lived there practiced idol worship and they would sacrifice sheep or goats to their, to their gods, and then they would sell the meat to the butcher. And he, in turn, would make that meat available to the public at a price. It's perfectly good meat, and the price was right, so some Christians would buy that meat and eat it. Other Christians, however, 
felt that God's people shouldn't eat this meat because it had been offered to devils, idols. And so there were these two opposing camps who began to argue bitterly about this issue and they turned to Paul for help and he, through the inspiration of the Lord, gave them the principle of example. He didn't give them an ironclad rule, he rather gave them a principle. He said that, look, meat would not make you better or make you worse. However, his advice was this. Don't do anything that would make you a stumbling block to another believer. So the issue is not whether it will hurt me. The issue is whether whether it will hurt my brother. Whether what I'm doing will hurt you. I need to be thinking about someone else instead of myself here. Because both sides of this argument thought they were right. They possessed insight. But Paul reminds them, brotherly love is the main objective. What's the loving thing to do? Am I going to hurt you? Well, if it hurts you, I ought not to be doing it. So you and I, we possess great liberty in the Lord. We can lawfully do many things, but we always need to be mindful of the example we're setting for others. We must never do anything that causes our brother or sister to stumble. Listen to the way Jesus puts it, and this will put the fear of God into you. Watch this. Matthew 18, verse 6, he says, If if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble... It would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. He took this rather seriously, didn't he? You and I should take it seriously as well. Am I being a good example? The Christian must always be considering his brothers and sisters. Am I a good example to people who are looking at me? Let's move on a little further. The fourth principle is one of edification. 1 Corinthians 10, 23 says, Paul says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. Or the old King James says, not everything, not all things edify. To edify, like construct, means to build up. Everything you do, you say, you hear, is either building you up or tearing you down. Every conversation, every relationship, every activity must be judged by the same principles. Does this thing make me stronger in the Lord? Or does it weaken my walk with Jesus? All of our lives should be lived in such a way that it does nothing but build us up in the Lord Jesus. Do the things you are doing make you stronger for him? If not, maybe it's time to let that thing go. But there's more. There's a principle of exaltation. 1 Corinthians 10.31 So whether you eat or Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of the Lord. I had the joy of doing some weeding yesterday in my garden. I thought like, oh man, weeding again. Yeah, It's not that much fun really. But I thought of it, thought, okay, well I can do it for the glory of the Lord. Lord, thank you that you've given me an opposable digit that works. And the arthritis isn't too bad today, I can actually do this. And I can pull weeds. And so I was, got to spend some time praising God. And as I was doing that, he said to me, how about the weeds in your life, Martin? You going to pull some of them? So I spent some time in prayer. <laughs> okay, Lord, let's do some gardening in here. That's the principle of exaltation. Do it all for the glory of the Lord. Everything we do in life either honours or dishonours God. Every conversation, every habit, every relationship, every business deal, every vacation, every book, every film watched, every bit of music listened to. Is it exalting God or is it not? WWJD, what would Jesus do? Learn to ask yourself that question. Or another one is just like it. It says, what would I do if Jesus was with me? Yeah? I was talking to the young people a little early about me stealing some biscuits. If mum had been in the room, those biscuits would have been safe because my knuckles would have had a wooden spoon cracked across them. Yeah? So what if Jesus were with me? I've got news for you, he is. The Bible says this, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. He's there all the time. What would I do if Jesus were here? What would I do actually if I was aware? How about I make the choice of being aware? He is with me. Whatever I'm doing, wherever I'm going, whatever I'm saying. Ah, 
That being the case, knowing that he's watching and he's paying attention, that he's involved because I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit, let's not sully this temple. That changes the way you make choices, doesn't it? Remember, as a Christian, everything you do reflects back on God. It can be positive or it can be negative. Philippians 1.27 says this, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Does your life exalt God in the eyes of the world? A very important principle, exaltation. It helps me make right decisions and good choices. The final one I want to talk about that Paul mentions is the principle of evangelism. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 30, 32 to 33 says this. He says, Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God. Even as I tried to please everyone in every way, for I am seeking my own good, not my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be, what? Saved. That's interesting. Paul's desire was he didn't want anyone to be turned off God and off the gospel by his lifestyle. So he strove to be inoffensive and to be an open book in his walk with the Lord. Now, I know that the gospel is offensive to those who are perishing. I'm aware of that. But my lifestyle needs to be reflecting Jesus in everything I do and say so that the opportunity when it comes... I won't be a stumbling block to anybody. People are watching you. Does your life move people toward God or away from Him? Lifestyle does matter. Often what you do speaks so loud that I can't hear what you're saying. Yeah? Who wants to be called a hypocrite? Not me. I want to try and live my life in line with what the Lord wants because people are watching. So we should strive to, to reach everyone we come into contact with for Jesus. Now, I don't mean preaching the gospel all day long. You can't be doing that in every single circumstance. But I can have such a lifestyle that when people see me, they go like, wow, what's that bloke got? Why is he different? Why does he make good choices? Paul puts it this way. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 2, he says, You yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. If I were to put myself in Paul's shoes, I'd say to you, brothers and sisters, you are my letter that I'm writing. And everyone, everything that you do reflects on me as the pastor of this congregation. Just the same way that Paul said that about the people that he was writing to. You are known and read by everyone. Are you a living witness for God? I need to be. You need to be. I've given you six principles. Is it expedient or beneficial? Is it enslaving? Is it a good example? Does it build others up? Does it exalt God? And does it lead others to Jesus? I summarize it by, is it loving? <laughs> That's a lot easier to remember, isn't it? But go back over this message. When John puts it up on YouTube, listen to it again. Write down the points. Think about these things. Think about your life. Take these principles and live them out. And you will be a blessing. You'll be a blessing to the Lord's work in this world. And then at the end of the way, when you stand before him face to face with Jesus, he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Oh, I want to hear those words. I want to hear those words that the Lord is pleased with me and with my life that I lived for him. And I hope that you also want that to be the, the end result when you stand before him and give an account for your life. They'll say, well done, well done. Because you made good choices. You applied the principles that are found in the scriptures. I don't know about you, but I really need God's help. So I'm going to pray. Father, you call us out to live a very particular lifestyle. And we recognize that, that our lives are known and read by everyone around about us, particularly when they know that we are Christians. 
So help us, Lord, to be obedient to you, to apply these principles to our lives day by day, to live lives that are above reproach, so that you, Father, would receive the glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.